Okay, thank you. So we've spent uh, two days looking at, or one day only, this is the second day, looking at nonlinear elasticity. Now we're going to forget about all those nasty nonlinearities and look at some of the properties of linear elasticity. In particular, we want to talk about uh, phonons and surface phonons or, or sound waves, waves, or surface waves. So here's the elastic energy which we wrote down before. We're now not distinguishing between alpha and I because we're uh, looking at the linearized theory. Now, of course, these things are the gradient of U. So I can uh, you know, write this as grad, uh, grad I U J plus grad J U I, and I can integrate by parts and put the derivative on here to end up with a U I U J where this, this matrix, which only depends upon two indices, is the derivative with respect to x and x prime. I guess one of these is an x prime. Uh, yeah. Of, uh, of the delta function with a matrix there. So this thing, when we Fourier transform, We have Kij of a wave number Q, which is just Q, K, Q, L, K, I, J, K, L. Okay. Um, so in the simple isotropic case, what that gives us is that A, I, J of Q is equal to lambda plus 2 mu qi qj plus mu times the projection operator onto the directions under the directions perpendicular to q okay so here we have a part that's longitudinal it's parallel to q here's a part that's perpendicular to q now the uh, we can write down newton's laws or Newton's law, that the mass times the acceleration of the point at x is equal to the force, which is minus uh, delta this elf delta ui, which is equal to um, K i j of x x prime, u j of x prime with a minus sign right there. Okay. So here's the guy with the minus sign. When you when you Fourier transform, you get a q, and this thing becomes minus this object right here, or Using this form, it, it is it's minus this guy. So let, let's just look at the isotropic one for the moment. The hat, of course, means that it's a that it's a unit vector. And this should be Q here, so. And I'm going to put a minus omega squared here. It's Fourier transformed in frequency as well. But I presume that going from this to this is not a mystery to any of you, right? I just say that this is e to the i, e to the minus i omega t and e to the plus i q dot x. So there's a minus omega squared coming from the two derivatives with respect to time. And we can now solve this exactly by writing ui of q and omega, but I, I'll leave the omega alone, is equal to qi hat u longitudinal of q. So there's a part that's parallel to q, and there's a part, so I'll call this thing So this delta, I'll call this guy delta ij transpose. 
So the nice thing about this is that uh, we've got this already written in a form which is diagonal. All I have to do is to note that UL is equal to QI UI. Uh, this whole thing has a U, thank you. As you know, you don't see the board sometimes. <laughs> It's when you lecture, you know, you're right up here, you don't see the board, and you think everybody, you know, saw what you did right. But, and it happens again and again and again for 40 years. Um, okay, so anyhow, this gives us then that uh, omega squared times m times ul is equal to lambda plus 2 mu u squared ul. And that gives us then that the omega longitudinal squared is lambda plus 2 mu over m times q squared, which is c longitudinal squared times q squared. So c longitudinal is the, is the speed of the longitudinal wave. And of course, we can dot this into the uh, perpendicular part, and we get that omega transverse squared is just mu ah. Another little bit of a slip up, which is easy to make. Anybody catch my slip up here? This shouldn't be M. This should be Rho. Rho is the mass density. Mass density. Mass density. Mass density. And Q squared. Okay, now of course we had more complicated systems. We'll get an angular dependent frequencies and so forth. But I just wanted to you know, point out, we will be seeing these uh, variables again and again. Uh, one of the things that's rather curious is that the, the bulk modulus, recall the bulk modulus is what measures the resistance to uniform compression, is lambda plus 2 mu over the spatial dimension. And if I set this equal to 0, I get lambda is equal to minus 2 mu over d. And that gives us that the longitudinal sound velocity is minus 2 mu over d plus uh, 2 mu over rho. So that's 2 mu over rho times 1 minus 1 over d which is positive. So we have this curious behavior that the system is marginally stable. I could even make B negative, which means that it would be unstable with respect to a static compression, yet the sound velocities are still positive. So that this is this funny business that you've broken both translational and rotational symmetry, which leads to that behavior. Um, the other observation that we want to make is that if we set b equal to 0, and I go to two dimensions, so let's go to two dimensions, then this becomes cl squared. This is a 1 over 2, which cancels that, is mu over rho, which is the same thing as the transverse velocity. So in two dimensions, when we go to a state with b equals 0, the two sound velocities are the same. Both positive, even though the b is 0. OK, so now we're going to look at the surface Rayleigh waves. I should point out here that the, the philosophy of calculating sound waves, the, the, the normal modes, are that you say, well, I've got a frequency over here, which comes from the mass. And on the other side, I have something that depends only on the wave number. And we just solve for omega as a function of q. When we do look at the surface waves, it's a little more complicated. We have to have a wave that satisfies the bulk equations and the bulk of the system. But we also have to match boundary conditions at the surface. And that actually leads to a slightly different philosophy on how to do things. So we have a surface here. What are the boundary conditions on the surface? Uh, well, you know, you have here, you can take a very thin layer and 
you can let that go to zero, so there's basically no mass in the layer. And that tells you that um, the forces on the two sides have to balance, which tells me that my boundary condition is that the stress tensor has to equal zero on the surface if over here I have a, a, you know, a gas or a vacuum. Otherwise, you know, it might be some other material, then you have a more complicated thing. But for the moment, we have that the uh, stress tensor on the surface has to be zero. <coughs> So I guess what I usually do is uh, let, me, let me make my surface be horizontal. So, I, so we have my surface down here. This is x in this direction. This is y in this direction. And I'm just going to do the problem in two dimensions. So our boundary conditions are that sigma yy at y equals 0 should be 0. In other words, the component of the uh, stress tensor, which has a force in the same direction as the normal to the layer, has to be zero. And then the other term is that sigma xy at y equals zero has to be zero. So what, we ha what we're looking for now is a solution that obeys the wave equation, obeys this equation in the bulk, but it matches the boundary conditions in the end. So what do we know about the bulk? Well, we've just solved this problem, and we know what the sound velocities are. So we have that in the bulk, if we have omega squared equals CL squared times QX squared plus QY squared, that's a solution in the bulk. But it doesn't decay. We can make it decay if we take e to the i QYY and let that go to e to the minus kappa y, or kappa, I'll, I'll tell you what kappa is in a minute, times y. So to do that, we let qy go to i kappa, where kappa is the inverse penetration depth that tells you how rapidly the, the thing decays. And we have two different versions of this. So from this equation, I have that um, kappa squared, so th this becomes q squared minus kappa squared, and it's a longitudinal part, so I put kappa longitudinal for the rate of decay of the longitudinal part, and that gives me then that kappa, wa uh, kappa longitudinal squared is equal to omega squared minus qx squared over cl squared. And of course, I will have a matching one that kappa t squared is equal to omega squared minus qy squared, a qx squared over ct squared. Okay, so for simplicity now, I'm going to drop the x. I'm just going to call this direction q. Okay. So that says in the bulk, if I have something that's decaying away from the left surface, I have a u longitudinal of q uh, and kappa is equal to a longitudinal amplitude, AL. And you, you remember that U longitudinal, I'm going to take it as a vector, and it's a vector that points along the longitudinal direction. So you recall that the longitudinal direction is one where I have the direction is QX, QY. That gives me the direction. For whatever the Q vectors are, QX and QY, this is the direction. And so this goes to QX, I kappa L, and so I'm going to write here that this is e to the minus uh, e to the I Q times X times e to the minus kappa L Y, and then it's, I'm taking it as a vector now, and I'm going to write a QX I kappa Y here. So this specifies a solution in the bulk that decays away from x equals 0, and therefore is a candidate for us to put into the theory. But this kappa L, it depends on omega and q. So our game is going to be that we use this and the associated uh, transverse part, where we will have here a minus i kappa longitudinal q x 
So if I were talking about, you know, in the bulk where both qy and qx are real, this is the vector that's perpendicular to that one. So that this is this is the transverse part. It has a, a component which is perpendicular to the vector. But that, now I've replaced the qy by an iq transpose. There we go. So I then have that there is a u transpose or u, u transverse of q and kappa. This is kappa l. This is kappa t is equal to an amplitude a transverse. Let's call that an a longitudinal e to the i q x e to the minus kappa t y and minus i kappa t comma q like that. Okay. So now I have to tell you what the stress tensor is at the boundary. And the stress tensor, which we calculated last time, is that sigma yy is lambda plus 2 mu uyy plus mu, it's mu, I think. Where is it? Plus lambda uxx and sigma xy is equal to 2 mu uxy. And uyy is equal to the y component of the sum of these two things. So, so the u that our total u that we have is the sum of these two things. So it's going to be this guy plus this guy with the two independent amplitudes AL and AT unspecified. So when we go through that operation, what we find is that UYY is rho CL squared UY, excuse me, sigma YY. Sigma Y is rho CL squared UYY plus rho, where am I now? times CL squared minus 2CT squared times UXX. That comes from the fact, to remember, that, that uh, here's the expression for omega L squared. The expression for omega T squared is this. So when I have a lambda, I can write that as a CL squared minus to mu, and that gives me that. So, and I'll write sigma xy as being equal to 2 rho c t squared times uxy. Okay, so we can write these then in the following form. This is rho e to the i q x comes outside. And then here I have um, i c l squared times q squared minus kappa l squared. Uh, let's see now, where did I get this? Remember now. Um, yeah, so I have to take the derivatives, right? So I have a u y y where I'm going to have a derivative with respect to y, which is going to bring down factor of kappa l, which is where I get this minus kappa l squared. The q comes from this part. And there is now also a minus 2q squared, minus 2q squared ct squared. All of this times a l. And then a minus 2ct squared times q kappa t times a t. So now we have the, the sigma yy expressed in terms of the unknowns, you know, the al and the at, which we're going to need to you know, specify what the amplitudes are. And then for sigma xy, we also have a row e to the i q x q times x that comes outside. And 
There's an overall factor of ct squared that comes out because that's all that appears here. And this is then minus 2q kappa l a l plus i q squared plus kappa t squared times a t. So we now have an eigenvalue problem, right? This, these two components have to be zero, so we have a two by two matrix in A, L, and A, T, and we have frequency dependence, which is hidden in the kappas. So we can then solve for what that equation is, and we'll find omega as a function of the other. So at this point, I will go to the other end of the blackboard and write out what we have here. So we have a matrix which is I, CL squared, Q squared minus kappa L squared minus 2Q squared CT squared. I need a little bit of room from here. So this is minus 2 Q kappa T C T squared minus 2 Q kappa L and I times Q squared plus kappa E squared matrix. So, <clears throat> you write down the uh, characteristic equation here, replacing kappa L squared by the omega squared minus, uh, where, where do I have that? I wrote it there somewhere. Uh, yeah, kappa L squared is omega squared minus Q squared over CL squared, et cetera. So, so when all of the dust settles there, we get that the determinant of that matrix is at least proportional to uh, 1 over ct squared omega squared minus 2 ct squared q squared squared minus 4 q squared ct squared kappa t kappa l equals 0. And this we replace by omega squared minus ct squared uh, minus Q squared over CT squared, and this one by the square root of omega squared minus Q squared over CL squared. So now we have an equation for omega, which is a little more complicated than what you have in the bulk because we have these square roots here. Now, of course, what we're going to do is to put this on the other side and square it, but what happens when you take an equation and you square it? You introduce extra roots, right? So we will have extra roots, but let's write down the final form. It's not absolutely obvious when you look at this right now, but when we get done, it's clear that the thing is sort of homogeneous in Q. If I set omega squared equal to CT squared S squared times Q squared. So this product of CT times the unknown S is the Rayleigh velocity of the surface wave squared. And so what I would say is uh, you won't digest this completely unless you do some of this algebra yourself. I'm going to give you the answer and you can tell whether or not I've made a mistake in the algebra. So you put this all together and we get an equation which is s to the sixth, you know, as, as I said, what we do is we put this over here, we square it. So we have an omega squared, an omega squared, omega to the fourth coming there, uh, an omega to the fourth coming here. If we have omega to the fourth, then we have things that go as, let's see, this goes like omega to the fourth, this goes like, yes, yeah, so, so that gives us terms in S that go up to S to the eighth. 
But it turns out that the highest order term disappears, and we have something that's only s to the sixth. This gives us then s to the sixth minus 8s to the fourth times, uh, where am I now? 8s to the fourth times, uh, da, 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 yes, 3 minus 2 ct squared over cl squared minus 16. This is sixth, fourth. Yeah, 16 times 1 minus ct squared over cl squared. And there should be an s squared here. Okay. Uh, s squared. Let me just check to make sure that I, I have this, this right. I think I've, I've left, lost a factor of. Um, Shoot, computers. Okay, I think I've missed a term here. One, one second, control eight. Actually, you guys have the, the notes out probably. Oh, I see what happened. Sloppy bit of sloppy business here. This. Oh. This doesn't have an S squared. OK, so that's a a third order equation in S squared, um, and you have to choose a solution such that S is less than one and greater than zero. Why does S have to be less than one? Well, you don't want the surface wave to overlap the band of bulk states, because you know, if, if, you have a, if you have a surface wave and a bulk wave together at the same frequency, they'll mix and do something else. So what you typically want is an omega versus Q, where you have a band of bulk states and then a surface state that comes in there lying lower. And that means that since you know, the lowest energy, the lowest frequency mode in the system is the transverse mode, you want the Rayleigh wave frequency to be less than the transverse phonon frequency or the speed has to be less. So the S has to be less than one. And when you get done, you will find uh, you know, a single solution that satisfies that criteria. Now, one thing that's interesting here, what happens when we let B go to zero? We just argued that in two dimensions, which is what we're talking about now, when B goes to zero, CT becomes equal to CL. So in that case, this guy goes away. And there is a solution, s equals 0. What's that mean? That means that the Rayleigh wave frequency is actually 0 for all q. Its sound velocity is 0. And there is another mode. There are two other modes, which are 1 plus or minus the square root of 1 over 2. And you can see that both of these are greater than, than 1. 
So we can toss out the other solutions, and only the s equals 0 solution survives. Now, of course, the arithmetic we just did works perfectly well for a three-dimensional system where I you know, look at a wave that st stays in a plane. It's exactly the same calculation. The CTs and CLs are slightly different. Um, in three dimensions, there's another wave called the Rayleigh-Lamb wave, which is a transverse version. Th th this is basically a longitudinal wave where the wave is, uh, is up and down. So you, know, you have a surface like this. The, both the motion and the penetration are here in the same plane. But now you could have another wave where you're vibrating like this back and forth and going into the bulk like that. And that's the one which is apparently more important for the geologist. You know, the, these surface waves between different plates are um, important things for earthquakes and the like. OK, so we're going to put, put this little bit of information away and keep it on our mind because we're going to be studying surface states for the Maxwell lattices eventually. I guess I'm supposed to learn how to use this thing that wet and sweats down everything. Let me let me start over here and Now, I'm, I'm allowed to go all the way over to the end of that board, so we'll start there now. OK, I just want to make another couple of other observations about um, about the, the linearized case. So we've just written down the equation that the, the free energy density can be written in the form of integral e the dx. U i of x, a i j of x and x prime, u j of x prime. OK, now suppose I add an external force to the system. We can calculate the internal force. So this is the force that's exerted at the point x by the stretching of the bonds around it. And this is equal to minus kij of x, x prime, uj of x prime, integrated over x prime. And if we're in equilibrium now, so at, at, at zero frequency, we're not oscillating, this has to be equal to, so this is the force, it has to be equal to uh, minus the external force that's applied. Right, because the sum of the external force and the internal forces have to be zero if I don't have any frequency, no dynamical motion. <clears throat> so that tells us that we can uh, differentiate this thing with respect to, to f, and we get kij of xx prime delta uj of x prime delta f external of k, say, is equal to delta i k. So uh, this is the response of u, the displacement in u, brought about by turning on an external force that, say, occurs at an x double prime here. So this guy we can call, usually we, we refer to it as the response function, the kjk of x prime and x double prime here. The response of u to the external force is that. And you can see immediately what that tells us is that i i j of x x prime is equal to k inverse i j of x and x prime. Or if it's a translationally invariant system, we have k i j of q wave number is the inverse high i j is the inverse of k i j of q. 
So why is that, that useful? So if we have any sort of perturbation locally, it can vary all around, and I want to know what, how the structure of the system changes in response to that force X perturbation. It's just IIJ times the force. Okay. So for example, we have chi IJ for the longitudinal case, for, for the isotropic case. Well, we, we know what the, the longitudinal and transverse parts of this KIJ, I, chi IJ of Q are, or the KIJ of Q are. We just calculated those. So it's the inverse. And this becomes qi hat, qj hat over lambda plus 2 mu plus the transverse part delta ij minus qi hat, qj hat over mu. Okay. So you can use this to do all kinds of things. Um, for example, we have this theorem that the fluctuation which is basically, for, for, the, for our purposes at the moment, since uj average is zero, it's this thing. And this is equal to 2 kbt times chi ij of x and x prime when you have a, a system that's in thermal equilibrium. Yes. So if, if it's a time-varying force, then what I need to do is actually exactly what was done at the last lecture. We have an M, a row, U, I, double dot, is equal to uh, minus uh, delta F, delta U, I, plus F external. Uh, this is, yeah, plus F, X external of depending on time. So I make this a frequency, this a frequency, and there's an omega squared here. So you get an effective dynamical thing, which is uh, 1 over minus omega squared plus lambda plus 2 mu u squared comes out. And that, that works perfectly well, too. And there's a generalization of this theorem to finite frequency, which, which uh, we won't have. OK. So I, I brought that up because. I'm going to schematically use that in the next session. Now, if, if we just have the harmonic elasticity that goes with, with this equation, then uh, you will automatically get what's affine response from that equation. So what is affine response? If I have a, So if I have a set of points, I'm going to represent them now as being points on a grid. Etc. I just draw lines through here like that. So this is a lattice, if you wish, but I'm just picking up out a set of points. Now, if I do a, a simple shear to this, for example, the body here converts into the sheared structure. When I do that, all of these straight lines also move over and shear. Go like that. Well, maybe it's better if I do this in two steps. Let me do this once more. So I have a bunch of lines here. And I shear it. So under affine transformation, the points that are on this line right here go over to the same lines that have been distorted. None of them move away from it. Or another way of saying it is that if I have a lattice composed of a set of unit cells, and I shear this lattice, then what I do is I get a set of unit shells, cells, each of which has the same shape as the macroscopic object. So that's what we mean by a fine. And you can describe it mathematically as saying that r i of x is equal to lambda i j x j. Remember, now we're not distinguishing between the alpha and the i. If this is a constant matrix, 
that doesn't vary anywhere, then all of the guys are going to be displaced the same way. Now, that's true for a cubic lattice and for some low index lattices. But suppose I put lots of atoms inside the unit cell. So something, well, let, let's just do something simple like this. And assume that there are, there are bonds here that connect things like that. Now, what's going to happen when I shear this? Well, since it's periodically repeated, the unit cell itself has to have the same shape. But the atoms on the inside don't. And they will, in general, be displaced relative to what they were before. So this guy might move down here a little bit, and this guy might move up here. And I, I'm, I'm not doing the guaranteeing you that I've got the right exact uh, you know, result for this form. But what happens is I, I've distorted the unit cell, and I've stretched some springs more than the others. And these guys, guys are going to relax and go to a new position to lower the energy. So you start off with the idea of having a, a, an affine response. But then you ask yourself, well, under that, if the boundary conditions that come with the affine response, will that uh, can you lower the energy by moving the atoms within the unit cell? Or another thing that could happen is we could say that the elastic tensor, this KIJKL, suppose it depends upon position and is of the form KIJKL plus a delta KIJKL that depends on x. And this is a random variable, for example then you can find what happens with the constant k, which will give you affine response. And you know, since the energy is of the form kij, kl, uij, ukl, plus the delta k, so and this, this guy depends upon x, and there's an integral over space. And, and I shear the system so that macroscopically it's done a group. Then, then you know, the uij, well, the ui of x goes to the little gamma ij xj. That's the same equation as this one, but only looking at the displacement. And then there can be extra changes that take place relative to this overall change. And if you plug that into here, you'll get you know, expanding out in the uij, the, the u prime, over here I'll get a term which is like gamma ij, the symmetric form from this, delta k times uij prime. And over here I'll have a term that's uij prime ukl prime. And if I then can ask what, what's going to happen to the uij primes, this guy acts as a source so if I minimize this, this whole equation over u, then I differentiate this with respect to u. I get k times u is equal to gamma, the, sh the affine shear times delta k. And so the delta k is actually acted as a force that moves the guys around a little bit randomly. So it's a simple idea. Because as you're dealing with fourth rank tensors, the algebra is awfully messy. Um, if you have the... Um, you know, the, the pictures that I sent you, there's one picture you may want to uh, look at. Oh, I have to restart this thing again. I forgot what number it is. If you pull up your pictures, there is there is a picture of that looks something like this. It has a bunch of vectors all over the place. What that is, is a picture of a simulation of a lattice where we've had random sites connected by springs, and the uh, variation in delta k. Remember, we, we uh, uh, did we do this yet? No, I guess we haven't done it yet. So, so, so the delta k, the, the k depends upon the coordination number of a given site. So if I have a lattice that has six-fold coordination in some sites, and four-fold and three-fold in other sites, then you have a random delta k. And you can do a calculation. And what happens there is you get very complex sort of vortex structures in the, the U prime displacement, which uh, came about because of the strain. Uh, so so you, there's a picture I have up in, you, you, in that file I sent you, and you can have a look at that.
Okay, now we're going to encounter non-affinity later on, which is the reason why I wanted to talk about it. Uh, yes. Yes. So, so that, in principle, will give you local, uh, right, yeah. And it will move around the vacancies, for example. It could, could do that, uh, make them want to go somewhere else. And you have a real crystal with dislocations and grain boundaries and all of that. They, they will contribute to that. So, so there, what, what usually happens is that the correlation links associated with the uh, non-affine centers are pretty short. And so, you know, if you take a piece of steel, which is really a pretty... It's not a very regular system. They have grain boundaries and all that all over the place. There's still a well-characterized, essentially isotropic elasticity that goes with it. So it's, it's not a disaster unless we have more complicated situations. Um, OK. So we've done continuum. We're now going to switch to looking at, uh, at lattice models. Uh, how are we doing for chalk? Start writing with my fingernails in a moment. Um, so we all know that, that matter is composed of atoms, and eventually at a microscopic scale, the continuum approach won't work. But let's imagine that we have a lattice of points. And for simplicity, we're going to consider, well, potentials between the points. So here I have a bond, and associated with that bond, I have a energy, potential energy, which depends upon the length of that bond. Okay. And this could, you know, at this stage, we can actually have further neighbor bonds, but you know, each, each connection between two sites, we assume, has a potential energy. And we won't worry about the fact that some systems have um, you know, effective three-body and four-body interactions or anything like that. So if we've been able to define a lattice with a set of points with bonds connecting pairs, we can say that the total potential energy of the system it's just the sum over all of the bonds, whatever they are, times the particular potential that's associated with that bond. And it depends on the magnitude of the vector that connects them. That's what we mean. This is, a, this is what we mean by a central force potential. Um, <clears throat> now, what we want to do is to expand this energy about its mechanical ground state. And we want to come up with an energy that obeys the rotational invariance rules that we discussed for the elastic part. So the first thing we want to do, well, for first, you know, what kind of VB can we have? Well, it can be a 612 potential. It can be anything you want. It could, for example, be just a harmonic potential where you have an RB minus an RB rest. You might, so, so RB rest is the position or, or the, the separation which minimizes this particular bond. And it could have a higher order term like this, rest to the fourth, that's a square there, et cetera. Um, when we put them all together, then it's possible that, and is often likely in fact, that when the system finally finds its rest position, these bonds don't have the length RBR. They have some other length, which is chosen so that the force on each side is 0. Right? So I'm going to call RB0. This is the equilibrium. The equilibrium position in the presence when you've tied it all together. So what we want to do is to expand this potential about this equilibrium position 
which we may try to determine a posteriori after we've expanded in this. So <clears throat> I'm going to follow the spirit of uh, what we did in the elastic theory by introducing the following variable. VB is going to be a kind of a stretch variable, which will have an analogy, or will actually become, the nonlinear strain we had before with some, some manipulation. So this is just, you know, this is clearly something that goes to zero when RB equals RB zero. It has the advantage that it's a perfectly nice analytic function of RB. So we're going to set RB itself, the vector, equal to the vector RB zero plus a delta UB. So what do we mean by that? So if we have lattice sites, which I'll label by L, L for lattice. So I have two lattice sites, L and L prime, and they're connected by this bond B, which I could say is equivalent to, to this pair L prime L. So RB vector is RL minus, RL prime minus RL is the, remember L is an integer index if you wish. Uh, or really, it's up to LD. It's just a set of integers or numbers that tell us where we are. Um, so this is equal to RB zero. Uh, I should have said RL is RL zero plus UL. That's what we've done before. This is, this is the equilibrium position, vector position, and there's a displacement relative to that. So I can write um, R, RB, the vector, as being So this is the difference between these two things. I'm going to call this delta UB. So if we expand in delta UB, we've got what we want. And so what we're going to do is to use this to, re to uh, enforce the respect for rotational invariance as I do the expansion. But eventually, we'll express this guy in terms of this guy. And then we will have a well-defined uh, thing. So what is VB going to become? It's a function of RB, but I'm going to write it as V of, uh, yeah, v of RB zero plus V prime at RB zero times delta RB zero plus one half V double prime of RB zero times delta, this is no zero there, delta RB squared. Now what I want to do is to express the delta RB in terms of the VB, and that we can do because we have that, uh, I don't want to do this now, Right, so RB squared is equal to RB zero squared plus two VB. So now everything's a scalar. I can therefore write RB is equal to the square root of RB zero, well, RB zero times the square root of one plus two VB over RB zero squared. And I can easily expand that now to be RB zero times one plus, you know, just doing a Taylor series expansion, uh, one half, let's see, one eighth is what it is, two VB over RB zero squared, all squared that's unrecognizable as an RB. OK. 
Okay. So delta RB is equal to VB over RB0 minus one half VB squared over RB0 cubed. And that's as far as we have to go to get everything up to order VB squared. So <clears throat> this then gives us that the change in V is equal to V prime of RB0 times VB over RB plus one half minus minus one half VB squared over RB cubed. And then plus a one half V double prime of RB zero times VB over RB zero squared. And I don't have to go any further. Now this breaks up nicely into V prime of RB zero times VB over RB zero. No, there's no RBs. Yeah, these are RB zeros here. These are all RB zeros in the, in the denominator. Yeah. Well, it's only on one. This is one bond. So for each bond B, I'm doing that. Yeah. Um, and then I have one half times VB double prime of RB zero. So that comes from this guy. And then there's one with a minus sign that has the same form. And it's minus one over RB zero V prime B of RB zero times uh, V prime B times VB over, let's see, the V double prime over R B zero. Let's see, I have this right. V B over R B zero squared. Squared. Correct. This guy has a V B over R B zero squared. This is V B squared over R B zero cubed. So I put one R B zero here and then the square there. Okay. So if it turns out that our system is such that every spring is at its preferred length, RBH, then of course this term goes away because the, the, the V primes are not there at all. Now, you, you could also use this formalism if you wanted to do something uniform. Suppose you took a lattice in which all of the springs are at their happy length and then you compress it with external pressure. Then the external pressure would induce tension in the bonds. Notice that we, um, yeah, that hidden in here is a quadratic term in UB, in delta UB. So, you know, if I replace this by the expression we have, where, where do we have the expression for what VB is? Uh, well, th th this, is, this is VB, and I should have written that out. So now we know what RB0 squared is. This is 1 half times RB0 squared plus 2 delta UB dot the vector RB0 plus delta UB squared minus RB0 squared. So we can write, well, this is bad fact. Black blackboard, not blackboard habit, but we can now write VB as being equal to one half of well, I'll write it like this two U B delta U B dot R B zero plus delta U B squared. I think I've got that right. This is a one half here. 
Yeah. So, so this becomes delta U B dot R B zero plus a half delta U B squared. I don't like the factor of half. I'll come back and check it in a minute. But the point is that this guy has both a linear term and a quadratic term appearing. So that says that if we have a V prime present, then this guy gives us an extra delta UB squared term that doesn't come from the second derivative. And that's a familiar phenomenon. Suppose I have two springs attaching a mass like this. Now, if the springs are at rest, to displace this thing upward, a distance S, say, is proportion, the force is going to be proportional to S cubed if these things were unstretched originally. So to harmonic level, something like this would not give you any restoring force for moving that guy up and down, fixing these two ends. But if they're stretched under tension, then of course it's, it's like the, the, and you're probably more likely to have seen it in a freshman class where you put strings there. You, have, you put a string under tension, then you get a force downward here, which is 2t times the sine of the angle or something like that, which pulls it down. When the springs are under tension, you then get restoring forces which aren't there when the springs are not under tension. And that's what, what this guy is. OK. So after all of that manipulation, let's jo just go to the, so at, at this stage, we still have sort of, the, we have the nonlinear terms present. You know, this thing, you can say, has a delta UB to the fourth in it. What we want to do now is to just look at the harmonic limit. That one doesn't clean very well, does it? It only requires the water. You know these new glass buildings? Do you guys have all your new buildings are all glass? We, they build these 80-story buildings, you know, all made of glass. And then you walk by and you see these people hanging from a string, washing windows for six hours. I just, I get very queasy when I see that. But that's what I feel like right now with this. OK, so we can plug in that, this expression for VB, et cetera, plug it back into here, and keep the, the uh, harmonic term, you know, only the terms that, were, that are quadratic. So the change in the total energy is going to be sum over all of the bonds of, OK, so now here, remember when I expand this out, I'm going to get a delta UB squared term. And uh, over here, I get a delta UB squared term also, which comes just from squaring this. So you put it all together, and what we get is a 1 half outside of VB double prime of EB0. I'll explain what these things mean in a minute. Dot delta UB squared plus See that. This is squared plus one over R B zero V B prime delta I J minus E B zero I E B zero J delta U B I delta U B J. OK, now the first thing you will notice when I've done this, this term has in it a linear term in delta UB. But I'm going to demand that the force at each site be 0 when delta UB is 0. And so if I look at what that is, it will give me uh, the force will be the, at each site 
or along each bond looks like this. And of course, I can rewrite that. I can put in the linear term and rewrite it as a sum over L and L primes. And the force at each L has to be 0. So basically, it's that process that gets rid of the delta UB term. And it's that process which determines what the RB0 is, given the RBHs. So I've tossed that one out because I said I'm in equilibrium. And now we have the harmonic part. We've now broken the rotational symmetry, if you wish, up to order, th uh, up to order theta squared. This preserves the rotational uh, invariance if I rotate by an angle. But it misses the higher order terms. So this is the standard harmonic or linearized theory. And notice we have two terms. One that comes from the second derivative of the potential, and it gives, it depends only upon the component of the delta UB projected along the bond vector, the unit vector along the bond. So when we have central forces and we don't have tension in the bonds, then the only the directions that the forces can point are along the direction of the bond. This guy depends on the VB prime, and notice. This is a projection operator onto the directions perpendicular to the bond. And that was exactly the picture that I drew here, th this picture. We're talking now about forces that go up perpendicular to have components perpendicular to the bond, and they only appear because you've had this guy there. Now, what we can have are, as I said, it's possible to have a set of springs and forces such that in the mechanical equilibrium state, there are a bunch of, say, random VBs, primes rather, such that the total force on each side is zero, even though there are, the bonds themselves are under tension. Or I could have stretched the lattice or something like that, and then I would have had bonds under tension also, but uniformly. That. Now, um, most of the time, because dealing with this guy is actually a little bit messy, I'm going to ignore it and assume that we just have this. So when we do that, as I said, all of the forces have to be pointed along the direction of the bonds to which they, they participate in. Say so that longitudinal stuff. Um, OK. Now, we've taken the harmonic limit. The other limit we want to take is the continuum limit. I start writing here with impunity. Where did I write the VB0? Yeah, so we have this equation. OK, what I'm going to do now is to take ask what is VB in the continuum limit. So VB is delta UB dotted into RB0 plus 1 half delta UB dot delta ub. So if I take the continuum limit where I'm looking at length scales which are long compared to the lattice spacing, I can take delta ub and say this is equal to uh, rb0i uh, is a vector grad j u ub Grad J times U. Grad, grad I times UJ. Put a J here. Okay, remember the UB is a difference between displacements on neighboring sites. I can then expand that out. This is the distance between the sites. And this is a derivative. And you can see now when I plug this back into here, I get that VB is RB0I, RB0J, times uh, grad I U J plus, uh, again here, U grad I U K grad J U K with a 1 half appearing here. 
Okay, right? Because I do this twice, I get, remember, th these guys are contracted with respect to each other, so the U index is going to be the same. Then I can use the fact that this whole thing here is multiplying something that's symmetric, so I can write this whole thing as RB0i, RB0j times one half grad i u j plus grad j u i plus grad i u k grad j u k. And this is exactly our continuum nonlinear strain. So then we can look at what the, uh, I can go back and look at, at this term. Uh, do we still have it up here? Yes, I can look at this term and expand it out. So, so just for simplicity now, let's, let's ignore the V prime. And remember here, I'm going to get the v, VB has a factor of RB0, RB0. So the net result is that I'm going to get uh, a sum over the bonds of a V double prime of R0, and then an RB0I, RB0J, RB0K, R B zero L times U I J U K L. Right? And this is sum over bonds. Uh, and this sum then I want to convert it to sum over sites. Um, and so the, the sum over sites goes to an integral d to the dx over the volume of the unit cell. And I get this whole thing becomes the KIJKL. Maybe there's a factor of two I haven't gotten right, but basically this is what you expect. And it's interesting because it has an extra symmetry which was not obvious from our expansion things. This is invariant under interchange of J and K, as well as all the other ones we had. So it has an extra symmetry which comes from the fact that we've expanded these bonds without doing any relaxation you know, to take care of non-affinity and so forth. And that's called, the, it's called the Cauchy symmetries. And, uh, you know, there was, in the 19th century, there was a lot of debate as to whether or not these things were actually true because they hadn't figured out the non-affinity yet or ways of, of uh, breaking that symmetry. And, uh, well, finally it was resolved. But this has the form you want. It, it converts the forces where you want it. And so if you want to actually calculate the elastic constant for a, a uh, regular lattice, this would be the first place you would go. And then you want to ask whether there are relaxations that go with the non-affinity, which will, will break that. Okay. Good. So that brings us to the end of standard lattices and elasticity. I want to now, so I should say just one final comment about this. If we, oppose, if we apply this symmetry to the isotropic case, what we find is that lambda goes to 2 mu. Lambda is equal to mu is enforced by this, symmet by this symmetry, this extra one. OK, so I have 11 minutes and 38 seconds left. Um, so I want to move now to the Maxwell lattices, which we discussed in the colloquium. So you'll recall that these are lattices in which the average coordination number is twice the dimension, and the canonical examples are the square lattice or the Kagame lattice, which is always difficult to draw. Uh, how do I usually do that? Uh, I do. And that gets repeated again and again. You have these straight lines like this and like that. And we had the pyrochlor lattice and so forth. So these lattices, as we found out, are just on the verge of mechanical instability. We have that dn, the number of degrees of freedom, is equal to the number of constraints, which for our case is equal to the number of bonds. Um, and we discussed a little the Maxwell way of 
doing things. In particular, we looked at a frame that looks like this, say. So Maxwell says that the number of mechanisms or modes of zero energy are the number of degrees of freedom minus the number of bonds, constraints. So here we have something where n is equal to 6. The number of bonds is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So Maxwell would say that the number of zero modes is 2 times 6 minus 7 was equal to 5, which is 3 plus 2. So clearly I can have uniform translation this way, uniform translation this way, and a uniform rotation. That takes care of three of them, leaving two others. And they are just these distortions of the squares such that none of the bonds change length. Basically, one's applying, well, a shear, but it's a shear with a compression. It's not the simple shear. Um, OK, so if I add one more here, this becomes 12 minus 6, which is 4. We still have the floppiness in this one guy here. We add another one, and we've exhausted everything. And we have three, just the three trivial modes left. But we discussed what happens when you put the x's here. So now we still have a floppy degree of freedom and a state of self-stress here. So we, we expanded this to say that n minus s, or maybe I'll use n sub s sometimes, is equal to dn minus nb. So we modified Maxwell's relation. Uh, it's worth looking at a couple of versions of the states of self-stress. This was the simplest one. But here's another one that's interesting. Suppose I have a beam like this, and I attach spr a spring to the end so that the spring is essentially coincident with the beam. So now you can imagine putting these springs under tension such that they're pulling this way. Then the, the beam underneath is going to push back in the opposite direction. And we'll have a situation where we have no net force on the sites. Um, yeah, no net force. So that, that, that's the definition of a state of self-stress. It's possible to have a situation where the sites uh, remain where they are, the forces are zero, but there are tensions in the bonds, or, or vice versa. Uh, the other example that we discussed was periodic boundary conditions, where you can think of this as just having a spring coming back the other way. We can stretch all of these springs, or compress them, in such a way that the forces are zero on these lines. So under periodic boundary conditions, if we have a string, we have a state which is able to have tensions in the springs with zero forces on the sites. Now, the configurations are not always so simple. So here's an alternate one. I should maybe make this a homework problem. Put this under periodic boundary conditions. Can it have a state of self-stress or not? So you know, for the next five minutes, why doesn't everybody sit down and think about that while I'm talking to see if you can draw, draw the tensions and uh, uh, compression, you know, the directions of the tensions in this, such that there are tensions in the bonds and no forces on the sites under periodic boundary conditions. This comes up in, in quasi-crystalline lattices. So I'll leave that there for now. So what we talked about after that was the maxwell calladine theorem, we called it. I don't know if I want to go through this water business again. So let's uh, see if I can just erase this. Yeah. In which calculation? Oh, I just didn't, no, they, I'm just summing over bonds. I haven't told you what the coordination number is, but it, it, it can be in any lattice. Huh? 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, in fact, we'll be using this kind of thing. Yeah, it could be. And, but what we'll find is that once I put it all together, the instabilities of the Maxwell lattice will become apparent because the, you know, the elastic distortions will have zeros. Okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, no. So if I start with a lattice that has no tension in the bonds and say I apply uniaxial stress to it, I push on the things, OK. What I will have then are a bunch of, uh, of uh, stressed bonds, which are stressed because I put a force on it. But had I put it under periodic boundary conditions, then I could have had a state where they were you know, I, I produce that compression without a force. So, and so, so there's a message that goes with that, is that if you know what the states of self-stress are under these periodic boundary conditions, so for example, this guy, you know, each of the lines here bonds under periodic boundary conditions represents a state of self-stress. Now I cut it. You would think that the state of self-stresses that I had before I cut will play some role in determining the rigidity of the system. And they will, in fact, and I'll, I'll, I'll derive that for you later on. Um, OK, so we started looking at the, uh, it was, I, actually, I started to erase with something here, didn't I? Just erase this. So we introduced these matrices. This guy is the dn dimensional. Vector of forces. So these are the forces at the sites. They can point in d directions, and they're in sites. So that's the dimension of the, that vector. We have T is the NB dimensional vector of bond tensions. Now, as a practical matter, what we're, you know, we're not going to specify a direction to the tensions as a vector. This, this TB is a set of signed numbers telling you what the tensions and the bonds are. And we will we'll have to reach a convention deciding how we're going to tell whether something's compressed or, or stretched. But the direction of the tensions are always along the bonds because we've just shown that the force, you know, the harmonic forces which we're talking about always point along the bonds. So the tensions have to be along the bonds. It's a different story if we have the VB prime and we're going to ignore that for now. We're going to assume that we're looking at lattices that are whose rest length springs are equal to their, you know, the, the rest, the equilibrium length is equal to the rest length. Uh, and then we have the um, U the dn-dimensional displacements and we have uh, tub i'm calling it e the nb dimensional vector of stretches of extensions at you know I'm not quite sure what term one wants to use. It, it's how much they've stretched, stretched or compressed. And that, again, is a bunch of numbers for that. OK, so um, what did we do here? OK, so we argued that there's a linear relation that takes the u to the, the extensions. And that, that's easy to see because Remember what, what our energy over here is. Do I still have it? Look at this. So this is the extension of the bond, bond B. right? But delta UB is a UL minus UL prime, which are the site things. So if I tell you what 
the site displacements are, I immediately tell you what the extension of this bond is, because it, it's a long B. And then we argued that we can have that the, um, there's another tensor Q, which when multiplied times the tensions, gives us the forces. And that this force is the internal force. And now I have to put a, uh, I have to put a minus sign here. So th this is a, one of these Z2 problems that we run into all the time. The convention in the, in the engineering literature is to look at a load as opposed to the tension. So the load, L on here, is that force which is necessary to balance the forces produced by the tensions in the bonds. So F for me is the set of, are the forces produced by the bonds instead of the force needed to equilibrate the bonds. So this is what it would be in the engineering literature. And you will see that, in fact, if we do it correctly, uh, you know, the sign is, is, is appropriate. Though I, I may be sloppy at times and forget to put the minus sign there. So these are well-defined linear operators. And you can see when we draw the, the picture over there, for example, where we're talking about states of self-stress, et cetera. You know, let's look at this guy now. Maybe I'll give you the, the answer, that, and I'll, I'll choose the convention of drawing the way I had before. Um, so here we can have the guy pulling inward. That's what those forces are. We'll have this guy pull out, and this guy push. And you know, there's another one over here that's pushing, et cetera. So we follow this along. And then up here I have dup, and here I have dup, dup, and this guy's going dup, dup, this guy's pulling upward, and uh, this guy's doing this, and this guy's pulling like that, et cetera. Now you can see as I go along that uh, the force on each side is zero, provided we've cho chosen the magnitude to be correct. This guy goes down here like that. Uh, no, wait a minute. This guy goes up. I think I drew this wrong here. Yeah, that guy goes down and this guy goes up. Okay. So you can see here I have three guys coming in and I can adjust the forces so that balances. Here I have these two guys pulling down and the other one's pushing up. And if this is, if this is periodically repeated, then you have the forces. And clearly, if I tell you what the tension in each of these three guys are, I can tell you what the force on that side is. OK. Uh, OK, one uh, observation. C is a, uh, C is an NB times uh, dn dimensional matrix. So if I draw the matrix, it has dn components this way and nb components this way. So that means that I multiply times a dn dimensional vector here, which is what u is, and what comes out over here is an nb dimensional vector. Okay. And if I look at q, it's the other way around. Q is a vector that has NB this way, or uh, rather a matrix, and DN this way, because it multiplies an NB dimensional vector and kicks out a dimension of vector DN. Okay? Um, so I guess that probably the, it's, it's blinking. It says 0, 0, 0 right there. So I think you'll have to wait till tomorrow to see the exciting extension of this. Good. Any questions? It's usually a bad sign. But, yeah. Can I explain what the arrow means? So if, if, I, if I push on something like this, then I'm exerting forces like that, and it's pushing backward with forces like that. So if I put a beam under tension or under, under compression or stretch, it will always have you know, resisted in both directions. So this says that uh, this guy is being pushed this way, 
and it's fighting back by pushing back like that. But if I look at all of the forces now, this guy's pushing this way on that, and so it's tending to give an overall force downward like this. It's balanced by the upward force that comes on that one. So this guy is being compressed, and this guy is being, um, let's see, this, this guy's being compressed this way, and it's fighting by, by um, no, I'm sorry. This guy feels like it's being stretched, and it's fighting by pulling backward like this. Let's, let's uh, do one more picture here. I take a spring like this, and I stretch it. The, oh, yeah, the, the, they are, yeah, there, there's some of these potential things like that. Now, of course, if you want to talk about the zero modes, then it doesn't matter. You can put in rigid elements if, if all you want to do is worry about the zero things, because if you don't change the length, that's it. But we do want to talk about what happens if there's a little bit of compression or extension. So even a, 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 you know those um, 3D printed objects, the bonds were actually struts which are sort of mechanical beams. And they really do behave like central force nearest neighbor things. They, they, they only, the force is only exerted along their direction until they buckle. And um, they don't connect further neighbor sites, unlike the Coulomb interaction or the 612 potential or anything that you have in real systems. Uh, you know, what we're looking at here now are definitions where we know what the bond is. Yeah. What about Which cross are we talking about now? Oh, oh over here. Oh, oh yes, yes. So, so here, um, this whole object right here can support stresses in these bonds. So suppose this guy pulls outward like that. That guy pulls outward like that, and that one goes like that. So over here, we'd push like that. Uh, this one is doing this. And let's say this one is doing that. And this one is pushing outward. So you can you know, arrange that. So some are under compression, some are under tension, such that the net force produced at each side is 0. Now, I can't do that with this configuration. I can't get every, you know, I can't. I can't adjust the tensions on those so that the force on this goes, goes to zero. So there's no, no state of self-stress there. And then think of it right, yeah, right, yeah. And, and so, so I will do a specific example uh, t tomorrow uh, when we uh, do it in detail. And I'll, I'll show you how to calculate both C and Q for a simple configuration. We have two brave people, three brave people now. You can be brave yourself. Okay.